if you own a gym or you need a gym, this is your guy. Hi, I'm Mike Arce, and I've spent most of my career in the fitness industry and helping those in it succeed. And after helping over 2,000 studios and 50 different franchises within the industry, I've learned a lot about what it takes to be successful. Here, I'll teach your studio how to advertise, how to sell, retain more members, increase profits, and become an overall better business owner in the space. And I share it all with you here. Welcome to the GSD Show. What's up, everyone? I'm Mike Garcia. Welcome back to another episode of the GSD Show. And I've got an awesome guest today. His name is Jim Dew. He's a wealth manager, and he has been managing us, uh, me in particular, over the last, I don't know, what, four or five months, something like that. Um, That's probably and, right. Yeah. And so we're going to talk a ton about what I've learned from Jim because it's been great and it's really opened up my mind on how to actually look at money, manage money, and protect my business much, much more. Now, before you make any decisions here, because I know you fitness guys, all you really care about is sales, marketing, retention. That's like the only thing you guys care about is sales, marketing, retention. Occasionally, if you have an issue, you care about people, culture, and hiring and firing and all that stuff. But um, Man, this is going to be, it should be what you consider like one of the sexiest topics in your business because at the end of the day, we've got to make money. We've got, we want to build wealth. We want to be able to build, um, you know, financial, not just stability, but financial freedom uh, with all the work that we do and all the sacrifices we make. And, and uh, Jim's helping me do that. And uh, I know Jim because he was referred to me by my coach, Cameron Harold, who's been on the show before. Cameron's awesome. But uh, Jim is part of Genius Network, which is a group I just joined, Joe Polish's Mastermind. And you actually work with quite a few of the people in the group, from what I understand as well. Is that right? I do. Yeah, yeah. there are okay. several people I work with in there. Perfect, perfect. So, um, guys, just so you know, if you have any questions throughout, uh, feel free to comment in the comment box. We'll be here. Jim's answering live as well. Um, you can also call in 480-750-9774 if you want to learn more about how uh, I work with Jim. Um, also make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, do all that. And, um, also if you stay till the end, Jim's got a really, really good offer for you guys too. So let's really get things, things started. Jim, man, I've learned so much from you in, in this four or five month period. And, uh, Cameron told me, he said, Mike, Jim's your guy. You need to get with Jim. He is a, a brilliant man and he's going to be able to really help you understand how to get your business to make money for you so that you can be free and you can do all the right things going forward. So it's nice of you to say, by the way, dude, it's I'm going to play this clip to my wife over <laughs> and over. I think <laughs> you should, man, you should. <laughs> and, uh, and I read your book. Um, I think as soon as I signed up with you, you sent it to me in the mail and that's the book right there beyond a million. And, um, so many things I learned, I think in our first consultation, cause I got the book, I read it immediately. And then we had our consult. And you were starting to go off and, and ask me questions like, oh, yeah, like the book said. And, <laughs> and I was already on top of it. I felt like the book prepared me for you so, so well. So great job with the book. And Thank you. Um, if anybody wants to know, it's called Beyond a Million. Jim Dew's the author, and I got him here today. So, Jim, welcome to the GSD Show. Thank you very much, Mike. It's great to be here. And I really am excited about everything you're doing and your company does. Uh, awesome, man. Same here. So I got to ask, let's start with the question because, you know, here's the deal, dude. These are fitness people, <laughs> so they're great. They're motivated. They're inspired. They, they're motivating. They're inspiring. They've got all the right things. Um, but I don't think a lot of them pay attention to the money part of their business well enough. Uh, you were saying you were saying something earlier to me. It was kind of like building up to a champion. What was that that you were telling me earlier? Often when people start in the wealth management game, I use a little of analogy, just thinking about it like a game. And with fitness people, this would be a very natural thing for them to understand. So as you start in the wealth management game, you're a participant. And I don't know if anyone has kids where they get a ribbon for 11th place. I wasn't one of those kids, but you're a participant. And when you're a participant in the wealth management game, you have limited options. And often you're just focused on your company or your business, and you're really not focused on anything to do with wealth building. And what keeps you in that level as a participant is avoidance where you just don't want to deal with it or look at it. To move beyond avoidance, you start getting a, pro a professional or two who can help you. And that's when you become a competitor in the wealth management game. You have a couple of good, maybe you have a good accountant, maybe a good insurance agent, maybe an investment advisor. So you have a few professionals helping you and that's when you can compete in the wealth management game and you start to actually build wealth. But to move beyond that from being a competitor to being a winner, now you have to have multiple professionals and you have to have a structure. 
Once you get to being a winner, your wealth is going to start growing much faster. But we want you not to get stuck in that area where you feel like it's good enough because you feel pretty good when you're a winner. We want you to move on and be what we call a champion. And that's where you truly have wisdom about wealth planning. And that's where you have not only a, a team and a structure, but you have someone managing that team of professionals on your behalf. Billionaires do it, they call it a family office, and they have a family office CEO who manages all the tax, legal, insurance, and investment professionals. To be a champion, you want to have someone, it's usually a wealth manager, who's managing all of those professionals on your behalf. Yeah, because I remember that was one of the first things I was like, you know, talking to you and you said, I want to be able to understand what your team is currently doing. I thought you meant my employees, you're like, no, your financial team, so your bookkeepers, your accountants, um, anybody that's managing money within your business, anybody that's managing any type of investments, whatever it is, uh, banking relationships. And I thought that was really interesting. And, and the goal was to help find, because I don't know what questions to ask. I just don't, right. I think I do, <laughs> until I hear someone else ask questions for me. I'm like, oh, that's a good question, right? So you were going to help me, or you did help me understand more about what my bookkeepers, my accountants, my financial team, what they're able to do, what they're willing to do, and what they're actually doing, find gaps, and then not only adjust and hold them accountable to filling those gaps, but also maybe even look and say, I don't even think they should be doing that for you. Right. Or that's that's not how I was structured if I was doing it for you. And, and, and it seems like you do it in a way where everyone gets along. It's not like you're coming down on people. I think we have a meeting set up, I think this week or next week uh, with our bookkeeper and our accountant. So yes. It's great to see that you all work together and you're kind of leading that ship. What usually happens over the life of an entrepreneur is you're going to pick up different professionals. You'll pick up an accountant, you'll pick up an investment advisor, maybe an estate attorney to do a will or a trust. The problem though is not always are these all A players. They're not communicating with each other. They're not collaborating on your behalf. And the worst part is you're in the middle trying to manage all of these professionals. Right. And it's like I tell people that, you know, if you, if I ask you who's the annoying one in your family, if you don't know who it is, guess what? It's you. <laughs> and the same thing, if you don't know who's managing all those professionals, guess what? It's you. And it shouldn't be you because you're not speaking tax, legal, insurance, and investment languages on an ongoing everyday basis. And if you don't speak those languages, it's going to sound foreign to you, just like you said. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely true. So I'm excited that you're doing that, not just for me, but for a ton of people. But now let's go into, I want to go into the stuff that's pressing on fitness studio <laughs> owners' minds. I think all business owners, but I've heard it a lot. Um, I've heard people at conferences, people have asked me about it too, like, hey man, I paid a ton in taxes this year. How do I get that down? And, you know, we hear stories of people, Trump, right? <laughs> but other people as well. We hear stories of people paying little to no money in taxes. Yes. People are upset with them. Right. Be and, and I don't know if upset's the word as much as it is hating, right? Like, how come? Because somebody said, hey, you don't have to pay tax. You'd be like, oh, okay, we're good. Right, right. <laughs> so it's, they want, they don't want you to not pay taxes if I have to pay taxes. But really it comes down to, well, you don't have to pay as much as you're paying either. You just have to understand the, the logic of it and how it all works. Hey, hold on. I know this episode's really good and you want to get back to it, but... Before we do, it's important you help me with something. Please like, comment, and subscribe to this show so that we can get more and more people to hear about it like you do. All right, thanks. Back to the episode. In your book, you said something about like 40 miles an hour like car. Do you remember what you said? In there? I do, yeah. What, what, what was it? Because I'm not going to say it as good as you did. Sometimes people are, especially <coughs> entrepreneurs who have businesses, they're scared of the IRS. And because of that, and often their CPAs are scared of the IRS. And by the way, you should respect the IRS yeah. and you shouldn't do anything illegal. But often I see people, it's almost like driving down the road and the speed limit is 45. And you say, you know what, I'm gonna do 35 just because I'm afraid I might get pulled over. Right. Makes no sense. Right. Why don't you go 45? Yeah. Now you don't want to go 70 in a right. 45. But often I see people with their tax planning, they're going 35 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour zone. The tax system is complicated. There are many opportunities to pay less taxes legally but often people don't even know where to begin and they don't understand it. And unfortunately, most people work with tax preparers, not tax planners. So accountants and CPAs who will take all the information, tell you how much you owe in taxes, tell you what your estimated payments will be, but they're not proactively bringing you tax strategies to put together a tax plan 
to reduce your taxes this year, next year, and the year after right. proactively. Right. So that's the first thing is that professional is often not the one that's actually going to help you get it done. Right. And, and here's the thing. like It's great to make a, have a million-dollar business or a $2 million business or whatever it is. It's great to have that. But having that and keeping a good portion of that are two very different things. You'd be pretty frustrated if you found out one person you know, had a million dollar revenue year and another person had a million dollar revenue year as you did, somehow they didn't pay hardly any taxes and you paid 200 grand. Exactly. It'd be frustrating. So- it Happens all the time. So how, let's, let's go into that. Um, really quick, by the way, for everyone listening or watching right now, uh, especially those watching live, um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you feel like you're paying too much taxes? Go ahead and use the comment box. Do you feel like you're paying too much taxes? And be honest here. I kind of want to see who we got listening in on a scale of one to 10, uh, 10 being super high, one being very low. How much effort and energy have you put into finding ways to pay less in taxes legally to make sure that you guys can have a more profitable year? Okay, so we got the audience engaging now and then we'll be commenting back as sure. we go. Um, so what are, give me some examples. So, so right off the top of the head, basic stuff, and then we'll kind of dig deeper. How can people pay less in taxes? Often I see people doing random acts of, of wealth planning and random acts of tax planning where they'll just hear an idea from someone and try to implement it. And one of the keys is you want to have a plan, which is multiple strategies put together in one plan. What, what are some of the common things? You say I hear people doing these common things. What, give me an example of like one or two common things that you hear people do. As far as reducing taxes? Yeah, because they heard it from someone. Like what's sure. the most common ones? So in the entrepreneur space, it might be, oh, I heard I could do a private insurance company for my company or I heard that I can do this thing called the Augusta Rule, okay. or I heard that maybe by structuring a plan through work I can save money by deferring money and also helping employees defer money. So they'll hear, hear things, they'll put a couple of things in place, but it's really not put together from the perspective of their situation, their business, their family, as well as making sure that they're not just one-offing strategies, that they're actually coordinated and working together. Right, so, so now let's, let's talk with me. I'm a fitness studio owner right now, and let's say I told you I did uh, 600,000 last year in revenue, mm -hmm. right? And we'll kind of go from there. Sure. So let's say I did 600,000 in revenue. Um, what are some questions you want to ask me to, to find out quickly on how I can start doing some things to save some taxes? So I'd first want to review the tax return and our okay. team would want to review it because we want to see what are things that are being done and what are things that are not being done. And that also helps us understand is that accountant really a tax planner or a tax historian? Right, right. And sometimes we have to bring in a What's tax a attorney. A tax historian is someone who's going to take all your information. They look backwards in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. And they say, okay, let's find out what you did over the last 12 months. Let's put it in the right places. We'll, we'll tell you what, we owe, what you owe in taxes and then what your estimated payments need to, go, need to be next year. Mm -hmm. A tax planner is someone who's going to say, hey, based on the, the last six months, here are some things we can do before year end to save you taxes this year. And oh, by the way, what's next year look like? Let's see what we can do next year and the year after. Proactively thinking about what needs to happen in your future to reduce your taxes. Because right now, for example, there's not much you can do mm. for tax year 2019. Yeah. But there's a lot you can do for tax year 2020. So that's one thing that a proactive- right now we're filming in February 2020, guys, so you know. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, can, can somebody be, can you hire an account that acts as both a historian and a planner? You can. Okay. Are they hard to find? They're hard to find. So, so do you need two people, like, generally? Or how would that work? Not always. So when okay. we step in, we usually evaluate all the current professionals, and we want to keep as many on the team as possible. Sometimes we find the accountant is very good. They're just not proactive. So then we bring the ideas to the accountant. The accountant goes, oh, yeah, we could do that. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. So they're not, so, so what they're doing is they're just looking back, like you said, historians. So looking back and say, hey, next year we shouldn't do that. Whereas now they're looking at it and say, hey, here's some ideas that we haven't done. Here's some new things that we can do. And so not a lot of them are being proactive and looking for new things. They're just looking to plug up some holes. Right. That you and had last often year. they're so busy right. because accountants get paid on how many returns they do. So if they're doing tons of returns, there's probably not a high likelihood that they're going to sit down with yours and go, what could we do that we're not doing that we could implement this year? Yeah. What we do is we assist to get that CPA or accountant to up their game. Now, if that accountant, we go to the accountant and go, here are five legal strategies that would save this client $50,000 of taxes this year, and they shoot them all down and say, oh, I don't understand that, I haven't heard of that, I don't want to do that, then we say, 
this person doesn't even have a knowledge base of proactive planning to where we can actually get some work or done. Or doesn't want to get his ass to work. Or doesn't want to do it. A lot right, of times right. they just don't want to get into it and spend the time. Yeah, I get that. And then from that point, do you recommend people or do you recommend they look for people and give them certain questions to ask, make sure they're interviewing for the right person? Both. So we will bring in the other professionals from a network of, of people we vetted and worked with in the past. But if someone says, hey, I heard this accountant or this attorney is fantastic, we'll take that professional through our vetting process to make sure that they're actually A players, and then we'll do an interview with them to make sure that they'll play well on the team. What's a question listeners right now can ask their existing accountant to be able to identify if they're a historian or a planner or both? Absolutely. One simple thing is, what have we, we done the last three years that have helped me reduce my taxes? What ideas have we put into place that have, uh, has helped me reduce my taxes. And if they say, well, what, what do you mean? We're mm -hmm. trying to help you. We categorize all the deductions for, we, for you. We make sure you're getting a write-off for your mileage on your car. If they're saying those kinds they're of checking things. Checking boxes. Checking boxes. Yeah, yeah. They should say something, and you should know. I mean, truthfully, you would know if your accountant is coming to you and saying, hey, Mike, based on the first quarter P&L, we're thinking you're gonna have this kind of year why don't we think about this or that strategy and spend the next few months vetting it? Yeah, That's what you hear. But the questions I'd ask is just tell me what we've done in the last year, two years, three years through your guidance to reduce what I have to pay in taxes. And they should have some very specific answers and not just, well, we make sure you take the deductions or right, right. We're, we're taking a salary and then we're setting up an S corp, you're getting a salary and you're getting a dividend. All that stuff's blocking and tackling. Should be stuff that's more advanced than that in their strategies. What about stuff like um, what, what plans or ideas do you have for this upcoming year? Even better, right? I love yeah. that question, is what can you do this year for me that we didn't do last year or the year before? And sure. often they'll say, what do you mean? And if, if you get that deer in the headlights, you know that they probably are not tax planners. Yeah, yeah. And even sense. you might say, here's another good question. <clears throat> this year we did 600,000, right? Your example. So if someone did 600,000, they go, what if we did 2 million? Right. What would you advise us? If our goal is to get to 2 million, what would you advise us differently than what you're advising us right now? And if it's not much, then that's someone who's not used to dealing with an entrepreneur who's really growing and has all this opportunity. And unfortunately, often entrepreneurs outgrow those accountants and don't realize it. And so they'll come to me and say, I've been paying all this taxes because I went from 600,000 to 2 million three years ago. Right. And we're doing the same thing that we were doing when I was making 600,000. Right. That's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. There are some times you can do, uh, revise your, your tax returns back years, three years back, but there's a lot of stuff you can't go back and change. Yeah. So right off the top, let's say 500,000, 600,000, let's say 600,000, they're doing about 15% uh, net profit. So what would that be like 90,000 mm -hmm. net profit, right? Um, what are some things that they can do? Um, like, like some basic things that you think all fitness studio owners, small business owners can start looking at it saying, you could probably do something like this, like that or that in order to help either defer or, or reduce taxes. One thing is if you're a sole prop, so you're not incorporated, you have a liability problem because your assets are now at risk. If your business gets sued, your personal assets can be at risk. So I would say if you don't have an entity set up, think about setting up an entity. Okay. One thing you can do on income is you can do something called an S corp to where you have a reasonable salary paid and the rest is a dividend paid out from the company. So that reduces your taxes. That's a yeah. pretty simple thing to do. There's things about um, if you want to help an elderly parent or a child, how you can gift money. So if you have something like appreciated stock, you could gift it to a child, an adult child, rather than giving them money and then paying in your tax bracket first to give them the money. You could give them a stock, they could sell it. If a single person's under 40,000 of adjusted gross income, capital gains tax rate is zero. So that would be a zero tax rate. Wow. Some other simple things that they can do, there's something called the Augusta rule. And the Augusta rule allows you to rent your home to anyone else for up to 14 days a year tax-free. So how does that work if you have a business? Well, if you have a business purpose, you can rent your house to your business for 14 days a year and it's tax-free. So it's tax deductible to the business, tax-free to you as an individual. So, so that's if you wanted to host any type of events there, leadership retreats, or even just work there, or just work there. Right, right? Now, I mean, that, that's- Absolutely. Yeah, that's really cool. So yeah. then you'd pay that, but then you'd get that money, that, that'd be something to write off. Absolutely, so let's say it's, and I don't know what kind of house we'd be talking about, 
you'd want to get reasonable quotes and things like that. But let's say it was $2,000 a day. You did that for 10 days a year, that's $20,000. If you're in a 40% tax bracket, federal plus state, that just saved you $8,000 right. in taxes. Because the money just went into your pocket. That's right. You paid yourself. Right. The only difference is you now get tax write off on that as opposed to you would have paid tax on that 20K. That's correct. That's so crazy. But what a lot of people don't know is you still have to document it. So yeah. sometimes we meet people, well, they'll do an they'll just, idea like this. Yeah. You have to document the business purpose. You have to have a lease agreement between you and your company. There's things you have to do. <laughs> to dot the I's and cross the T's. And that's why doing legal tax planning, even if it's legal, but you don't document it right, that can be a problem. Yeah. But that's an easy one that people could be doing a lot. Yeah, one of the things that um, I do at the end of the year, and it's, we seem to be on the same page of it, uh, of this, is really like towards the end of the third quarter and all fourth quarters, look for things that I'm gonna be paying in January mm. and the following for the next year. I already know I'm gonna pay them. And if I can go ahead and just get them now or pay them now, um, like rent, like if we could pay rent six months in advance, maybe even get a deal on the rent, but now all that reduces our profit. Because, you know, the benefit of being a business owner as opposed to, you know, let's say an employee, right? An employee, they get taxed first, then they get their money. Right. Right? You don't even, they get their paycheck, the taxes are already out. Right. Now, obviously there's a lot of benefits to being an employee, like you will get a paycheck. That's a great benefit. Right. We many times don't. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But um, on, on the business owner side, you know, you first get your money and then you pay taxes on whatever money you've got, That's whatever right. money you've made. That's right. And so if you can show that you've made less money because you've paid for things that you know you're gonna buy anyway, right. at the end of the year, let's say you were gonna have 90,000 in profit, but you found a way to bring it down to 30,000 in profit because you spent $60,000 on, on stuff you were gonna buy anyway, or revenue generating activities like marketing or salespeople or or uh, sales managers, or whatever it is that you're gonna do to, in order to generate revenue, you can do that at the end of the year. Now you're only paying taxes in the 30 grand as opposed to the 90 grand. That's very true. Yeah. There's other things you can do if you need a vehicle for the business. Which we did. Right, yeah. so you can do section 179 plus with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, there's bonus depreciation. So if you bought, for example, a SUV that was more than 6,000 pounds, something like a Range Rover, mm -hmm with the current tax code, you could write off the entire purchase of that vehicle for your yeah. business. So which, I wouldn't which say- Which is equivalent, like, let's say a car costs 70 grand. The tax savings on that, that, that kind of, does that kind of bring it down to like a $55,000 car? It does. Yeah. It brings it down a lot. Yeah. Now, I, I also would say you don't want to just spend money right. for things you don't need. <laughs> right. So if you talk yourself into needing a $100,000 car when you really only need a $50,000 car. Get the 50 and get the savings yeah, the 50 even and go do some other revenue generating stuff. Right, right. Yeah. And then there are other ways you can save in taxes besides just spending money on stuff that you are gonna get a deduction for. Awesome. So for everyone watching right now, they're streaming in, you know, uh, use the comment box, let me know, have you done any of these? The Augusta Rule is cool, you talk about that in your book, but whether it's deferring taxes or um, charities or whatever it is, what are some things that you guys have done uh, to limit your taxes or lower your taxes every year, the, the amount that you have to pay? All right, so while those questions come in, let's go on to the next thing. What are some mistakes that you see business owners make when it comes to managing their money and their wealth? Some common mistakes. The biggest mistake is not having the right people helping them and not having the right structure for those people. And, you, and by that you mean your financial team? Like I mean your about. financial team, your, whether it's an attorney, corporate attorney or state attorney, accountant for taxes, insurance agent, investment advisor. You wanna make sure those people are really good at what they do, that they're A players, that they're talking to each other, and then ultimately as you grow, you want someone managing those professionals on your behalf. You don't wanna be in the middle of trying to manage right. each of those relationships. That's probably the biggest mistake I see. Because the difference between a good bookkeeper and a great bookkeeper is usually only, what, a couple hundred bucks more a month? Absolutely. But at the end of the year, that can mean like tens of thousands of dollars in saving or loss. Yes. Right? And then same thing with uh, an accountant. Like an accountant, I mean, how much more expensive is going to be between a good and a great for a business and small business? Sometimes it's no difference in cost. It's just, it's just people don't know. Don't know the questions to ask. They don't know how to evaluate these different professionals. And that's an important thing. You want to make sure you have A players. Most people are picking their professionals because they met someone or a friend said, hey, use this person. Mm -hmm. And really, you want to make sure you have A players. And so that I'd say that's a huge mistake that business owners make. I think the other mistake they make is not anticipating the exit from their business. Everyone will exit from their business, period. Whether you sell it, you get sick, 
you give it to your kids, a competitor eats your lunch, you get tired of it and you walk away, no matter what, you're going to exit your business. And thinking about what that looks like, either creating enough wealth outside your business so that you can walk away and you still have a great lifestyle, or if you're gonna sell it, preparing to sell it way in advance so that you get not only the highest multiple, but the best after-tax benefit to you. Um, going back to the, you know, asking the accountant like the right questions, I feel like now knowing you and the way we've kind of been, you know, consulted, if I were gonna go look for a new accountant today, I would want to ask questions before he does. Yes. Like I, I, I wouldn't want him to ask me the question of tell me about your business, how much revenue is it doing? Right. Before I ask him, hey, tell me about the average revenue that your clients do. Right. Because I feel like no matter what I say, it's going to adjust his answer. So if I were to say, oh yeah, our business does let's say a million dollars a year, right. He's going to say, yeah, we work with a lot of people that are doing about a million dollars a year. Right. But if I were to not hint to what I make and say, actually, can I ask you some questions? What's the average? He may say two fifty to three hundred thousand. I right. know that I'm probably talking to the wrong guy. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think that's true of all professions. <laughs> so investment advisors, wealth managers, accountants, attorneys, mm -hmm. most are generalists. They'll work with anyone who needs their services and anyone who has money. What's your niche? Entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs who are founder owners of their companies and they're doing north of one million EBITDA, which would be profit. So one to twenty million profit is where our specialty is and where I feel like we do a really good job. So you wanna know what someone's specialty is, and then you might ask them, okay, give me some examples of things that you have advised that have created results for your clients that it would be good results. Rather than just saying, do your clients like you? Do you do a good yeah, job? Yeah, yeah. The things Those that are we, loaded questions. But if you say, give me some specific things you've done for clients that have created results for them, then they're gonna to have to really tell you some things. And with an accountant, you should hear some things and you go, wow, that sounds really interesting, like the Augusta rule or something yeah. like that. Not, oh, well, we just make sure you don't get in trouble and we make sure you take the deductions and we file your returns on, on time. That's not gonna cut yeah. it. So how many of you guys watching in right now, how many of you guys are, are going, man, I should probably reevaluate my relationship with my accountant or my bookkeeper or my attorney? Uh, be honest, I, I, use the comment box to let me know, like, are you guys, like, use a little emoji where they raise their hand or something, or are you starting to think, man, maybe I should start asking some of these questions? Which I think, yes, the answer is yes, because you might get the answers that you want, so that's a good thing. So, what are your thoughts on, a lot of employees ask about this, right, 401ks. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of employees ask about that, and, and sometimes it could be the reason somebody goes with one opportunity over another is because of the 401k. So what are your thoughts on 401ks? Is it a good idea, bad idea, and in what cases, why? 401ks, I would say, are specific based on, on every owner. Employees like 401ks. You can do matching with 401ks, so they're getting free money added. So one of the things you have to ask yourself is, other people who are competing for the employees you want, do they have benefits like a 401k that are highly valued by your employees? So the first thing is thinking about building your business. Your most important asset is your own business, and if you can get better employees because you have a 401k plan, regardless of the cost of the plan and the other things, it still might be worth it. Yeah, because those employees will generate more revenue and they'll keep more of your members to keep paying you every month. Definitely. Happily. One thing I caution with 401k plans is often 401k plans are set up for small business owners where the business owner is the trustee. Mm -hmm. They actually call it the 338 fiduciary. And what that means is if you're the business owner and you're the trustee, if an employee gets mad, or a former employee gets mad and they sue you because they say that you didn't have the right funds in the plan or the right choices of funds, they're gonna sue you. You're gonna be on the hook for that. And most or a lot of the 401k plans that are presented to business owners, they want the business owner to take that responsibility because they don't wanna get yeah, sued. Right. So one thing you wanna ask is, am I the trustee of this plan? Am I the 338 fiduciary of this plan? You don't wanna be. You wanna make really? sure you outsource that. and. Most plan sponsors will take that responsibility, sometimes for a fee, it might be a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks But if you don't say anything, they'll give it to you. They'll give it to you. And there's been some very large lawsuits against some very large companies wow. about 401k plans. So if you had an employee that was mad at you and they said, how can I get that person? One way would be sue you over the 401k plan and just say the funds were too expensive or we didn't like the funds and you made a mistake, and all of a sudden you're in a lawsuit. So you don't want that liability, and I see that mistake all the time with business and now owners. in this case, by making them the trustee, the lawsuit gets sent over to them. Exactly right, because <clears throat> then they have the responsibility, the plan sponsor, about which funds are chosen, what exposures, all those things. If you're on that plan, and if you don't know, it's just like I said earlier, if you don't know who the annoying one in your family is, it's probably if, if they haven't told you, oh, by the way, we're gonna assume that liability risk, 
you're, you're probably, probably <laughs> assuming it because they would tell you if they're yeah. doing that because that's a benefit they're to hoping you. you don't even know the question to ask unfortunately that's often the case wow it sucks but it's true yeah. um you heard of dave ramsey i think his name i dave have ramsey. of course he's got this big big message out there about how you should never ever have debt However, there's also some contradicting information in the entrepreneurial world where there's good debt and it's good to have debt. So is it good to have debt and in what cases would you say that's true? I hate to give you the answer, it depends, but it really depends. So yeah. it depends on, you have, first off, you have to know yourself. And a lot of the reasons why Dave Ramsey, who speaks to the general masses, says you shouldn't have debt is because most Americans get themselves in a debt problem and they can never right. get out of it. So if you can't manage that, you should work on getting your debt paid off. So yeah. I agree with Dave on that stuff. If you're a business owner, sometimes debt can help you grow your business, can help you keep more money in your business, which is your fastest growing asset in many, many cases. So it really depends. I would say that there are better kinds of debt. I know Dave Ramsey says there is no good debt, right. but if your debt is actually something that you can write off, so it actually helps you on your taxes, that's better debt than something like credit card debt or debt on an automobile that you can't write off. So that's one delineation that I think is important. One other comment I want to make about debt for business owners is access to capital is critically important. And also getting good interest rates and good terms on any, any loan. So if you buy a home, if you get a poor interest rate because your credit's poor, that's going to cost you, could be hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of that mortgage. Right. So you want to keep your credit as good as possible and you want to get as much available credit, like lines of credit, as possible as a business owner. And typically, you want to <laughs> apply for lines of credit when your business is doing its best. Exactly. So if you're doing really well right now in business, you want to apply for one now because your numbers look good and the bank feels safe that you, are, you can be trusted, so they'll give you a higher line now. So when you need it, you've got it, as opposed to now when you need it and you haven't applied for it, going to apply for it, the bank's going to go, yeah, you look like you're in trouble. I'm not going to give you this line or I'm not going to give you as much. Right. And then you want to have two banking relationships because if you pull the line of credit, guess where you don't want to put that cash? In the same bank. Really? Oh, absolutely. Because they can grab that asset. If so they, they can like freeze your assets. So if, so if you get a, if your accounts, like your, your bank, your savings, your checking, all your bank accounts are all with, let's say, Bank of America, you want to get a line of credit outside of Bank of America, like with Wells Fargo or Chase or some sort of like a... I, I get as many lines as possible, but my point is... Really? Yeah, I, I, you want to have as much access. Now, don't run them up. Yeah, yeah, don't use them, just but, have them. But I often see entrepreneurs who get in a situation where they're like, I, I don't have any capital. If I had some capital, I could weather this storm I'm going through, but I have no capital. Right. So then they either give up equity in their company or they're begging for investors who are going to ask for very aggressive terms that are going to hurt them. Or they're letting go of employees that are good employees. Absolutely. They'll cut their employees down to they're their They're letting bone. go of marketing that is saving their business. They won't do the marketing, which is the That's lifeblood of any business. the first thing they cut. So as an example, I think entrepreneurs should have access to capital and then look at your profit loss, your P&L every quarter. And if you know you go to the bank once a year, let's say in April, you go to the bank and you look at your, they look at the line of credit and they look at everything and then they approve you for another year. If your last quarter P&L dropped significantly, I'd pull that line, put it in another bank. Really? That way when you meet with them, if they go, hey, we don't like your numbers, we're, we would have closed your line, but you just pulled the whole thing. Yeah. Then they'll work with you. You could go, I tell you what, right now we're having a tough time as you can see from the numbers. I'll start little payments let's do like a 10 year plan or something. I'll start paying you back. I'll get you on something where you're getting money back, but I just can't give you the money right now. I don't have it because I'm, I'm running the business. So those types of moves that are proactive, again, you always want to be thinking forward, have access to the capital and then get the capital and put it somewhere that's secured that the bank can't get to it until you work through that tough time. So I always say, whenever your renewals come up every year, look at your numbers. If right. they're nose diving, that's when you should take action. Not wait for the bank to go, oh, we closed your line. But, right. but well, I need that money. Right. Too late. Now, now, here's the thing. Line of credit isn't just good for when you're in a jam. It's also good when there's a great opportunity. And losing out on a great opportunity can be pretty expensive, right, in opportunity costs. So let's say I'm a fitness studio owner. Let me know if my way of thinking is right here, right? Because okay. you may go, Mike, that's actually a dumb idea. Don't do that. So guys, <laughs> listen to me, but don't act on it until you get Jim's blessing. <laughs> the way I look at it is I want to meet every other fitness studio owner within a five mile radius, maybe even a 10 mile radius. I want to know where all of them are, right? I want to know them. I want to go to lunch with them. I want to make relations with them because a lot of them are, are not doing a good job. 
A lot of them are failing. A lot of small business in general, but we're gonna stay on fitness, right? So they may be doing good in regards to, they've got a good book of business, they've got 200 some members, they're actually charging a decent amount, they got some good contracts, but they're overspending in this area or they're mismanaging their business in that area. They're getting into themselves in some trouble, whether it's like uh, retention with employees or culture or whatever it is, and they just kind of want out. They don't want to do it anymore. And how great of an opportunity I would see to go, well, that business is only, it's four miles away from my existing business. I'm already pretty loaded up. I'm going to want to get a new location anyway. It's already built like a studio. It's already built similar to my studio and it's got a book of business already that's going to pay me every month because he wants out. I can possibly buy him out and immediately get cash flow on a monthly basis and get my brand extended. That's my idea. It's not good yet, Jim. I think it's a fantastic idea. I okay. think that's a great way to look at it and to know those those different business owners around you. And then I would also say, even if you have a line of credit, try not to use your own cash. Yeah. Try to structure a deal with them so, that would okay. be appealing to them. So you might say something like, uh, here's the way we'll work the deal. We'll, we'll give you a deferred down payment, Okay. which will come in 12 months. So how does that work? So, so let's say I'm the guy. It's kind of a play on words. It's a yeah, yeah, down yeah. payment. So let's pretend I'm the business owner okay. that you're approaching and okay. I go, Ooh. all right, man. Um, yeah, I I'm, had one bit of color first? Yes. That? Let's assume that I know this business very well and I know your business well enough. And I know that I know how to market and you're not very good at marketing. And I also know you're not utilizing your space the way you could for your business. And I know maybe I could add a spin class or I could add yoga or something that I know I can add value. And I feel that I could easily double your revenue in the next 12 months, knowing what I know, mm -hmm. and that you want to get out, you're, you're done. So if we have that as a backdrop, so in my mind, I'm already thinking, if I take this business over, I can double the revenue in 12 months. Which is important to know, because that'll help you decide on what you will be willing to pay for it. Right. And how. Right. Okay. Right. So now, you, would you, like you, you were saying like, oh, you wouldn't, you do like a deferred way of paying. So what would you approach me with? Rather than come up with the money, I, I might all say. All up front. Yeah, all up front. I might say, then I have all the risk. I would say something like, so what, what's your revenue you think you'll do, or you did the last 12 months, what kind of revenue did you have in the company? And let's say it was half a million dollars. Right. And you, but you want out. And I said, well, you know, what if I paid you half a million dollars for your business? And if you like that number, I'd say, here's what we'll do. I'll pay that to you over the next 12 months, that 60,000 a month, or 40,000 a month roughly, for 12 months to get you your 500,000. Mm -hmm. But I know in the next 12 months, I'm gonna pay you out of the revenue already coming in, plus right. every month that goes by, the revenue is gonna be going up. Because you already know how to increase. So you're gonna start profiting from the first couple months. That's exactly right. And then 12 months later, that person's out, I own the whole business, and, 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 it's, and, now, and now you've just immediately given yourself a $40,000 raise exactly. every month, as soon as he's out. Exactly. See, this is why you're here, Jim. <laughs> this is why you're here. So make friends with your neighbors, know where they're at. Smart. Okay. Um, how much liquid savings do you think a business owner should have in the bank? The general rule is three to six months worth of expenses. That would be the general rule. So, but, it, so, it, but it depends on the kind of business. If your business is cyclical, if your business... What do you business, mean by that? Uh, let's say, for example, that you know in your area a bunch of snowbirds come out and use your facilities for certain months. Like we have in Arizona. Like we have in Arizona. So summer would be a slow time in Arizona. Right. So then you go, well, gee, I need more money to get me through the summer than a business that would have the same revenue consistently across every month. Right. Got it. Got it. Okay. So generally, you know, if let's say expenses are around 30 grand a month, you'd want to have about 90 to $180,000 in the bank or just somehow liquid where I can draw money out. In the bank is best, but in the bank's best. But beyond that, definitely lines of credit for something that would really be bad. But at least I'd say three months of expenses in cash, and then the rest can be lines and lines of credit and those types of access to capital. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> after you've achieved that savings goal, um, what should business owners do with excess money? Because there's that's it's a big thing, right? It's exciting that you've got your savings goal, but a lot of people just get addicted to saving. Yes. And next thing you know, they're going for two hundred thousand, two hundred, and they don't need all that money in the bank. So what should you do? Because, and, and by the way, I believe reinvesting it into your business is step one. Like, do you have the best people? Are, are you able to, you know, retain your people better? Um, do you have the best equipment? Is your, is, your, is your energy and your atmosphere for your customers really top notch? How can you invest in that? But it gets to the point where I've seen in my business, I can't invest 
all the money back into my business that I've got ex in excess of without me getting like diminishing returns. It gets to the point where I'm kind of wasting money, I think. So what do you do with that excess money after you've reinvested it back into your business and made it great? It's something that entrepreneurs need to think about because you want to think about maximizing your wealth both inside and outside your company. Mm -hmm. And I tell business owners, and it's in my book, that you have this printing press, this machine, this business you've created. And reinvesting and making that machine better, as you just alluded to, is really important because there's no investment that's going to be better than your own business. Nothing will get you as good a return as you can get from your own business. Right. That being said, your business takes your time, your creativity, your energy, and you may reach a point where you don't want to do that anymore, or you maybe want to sell that. So it, it's also smart to create a second printing press. And that is something that's not going to be exciting. It's not going to print money like your business is going to print money. Right. You gradually want to build that up over time so that if you have this money outside your business that can produce an income equal to what you need to live your life, now right. you have true freedom because you now you don't have the stress of trying to make your business work. You can keep running your business forever, but it changes how you feel about it. So that's the first thing is you want to start siphoning money off after you reach a point where you've invested in your business and you actually are making money and doing well. Keep reinvesting your business, but also putting money outside the business. How do you do that? The first thing I would say is if you can do things that are helping you on your taxes and helping you invest at the same time, that's a great benefit. What's an example of something like that? It could be something simple like a 401k, complex like what's called a benefit focus plan where a business owner can put as, as much as a million dollars a year away into a plan like that. It could be having your own private insurance company for risk management where you get a deduction against ordinary income for the premiums. Years later, when you close that down, it's treated as capital gains. So you get an arbitrage. You can build up funds within in that private insurance company. So any way that you can get a tax benefit in addition to getting an investment benefit, you're kind of doing double the work on that side. Another mistake I see with entrepreneurs is when they put money outside their business, they either put it in cash because they're too scared about stock markets high or whatever they might be feeling, but over time, you really want to invest in something that's going to grow. They either do that or they want to buy Bitcoin or Tesla or something like that. In your business is where you should take your risk. Mm -hmm. Outside your business, <coughs> business, you want to be diversified and you want to be in a portfolio of either real estate or stocks and bonds that you kind of know over a long period of time how it's going to do. And that's hard for entrepreneurs because they want to invest in exciting things. Something that gives quick. That's right. And generally that doesn't work out for them. So thinking about in those terms so that you have a risk budget outside your business. So if you have $100,000 outside your business, your risk budget might be 3000 mm bucks. -hmm. So you can put 3000 bucks in Bitcoin or Tesla. But the other 97000 should probably go into something that's more predictable and reliable over time. That compounds over time, That too. compounds over time. So you get rich by being concentrated in a business. You stay rich by being diversified in real estate and stocks and bonds. And if you never have that big exit from your business, you want to gradually develop those investments outside of your company. Awesome. Love it. Um, you talked a lot about protecting your wealth. Once you get it, protecting your wealth. What are some ways biz or business owners can protect their wealth from getting taken away from them? One of the biggest things, and I, I use an acronym for asset protection, which is having a plan so your assets can't be taken if you get sued, or if there's a divorce, or if there's you know different things. Like if you have a child that goes through a divorce, and you have things set up in a certain way, you can actually protect that child. But at any rate, protecting from lawsuits. So there's an acronym I use called ILATE. I, I late. I late. You don't want to be late on your asset protection plan. Okay. And what I mean by that is if, if you went out tomorrow on a bicycle without a helmet and you crashed and you had a head injury, you can't then go back and put, put on that the helmet. helmet and be better. Right. So you okay. have to put on the helmet before the accident. So when it comes to asset protection planning, I late stands for insurance, laws, annuities and life insurance. I'll talk for a second on that in a, in a minute. Uh, uh, trusts and, and, uh, and entities, trusts mm -hmm. and entities. So we think about each of those and insurance is your first line of defense. So every entrepreneur or business owner who has any kind of income, you need a personal umbrella over your auto and your car and you need a commercial umbrella within your business. And then not only do you want to have those liability protections, but you also want to know what's in those policies. Often the big insurance companies advertise that, hey, cheaper is better, but policies are not created equally. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have a policy for liability in your business, but you don't have anything on employee practices law and then you get sued for discrimination or wrongful termination, mm -hmm. you have no coverage. <clears throat> so not only are you going to be exposed, but you're going to have to pay all the legal fees 
to do discovery and everything else, and that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. So having liability protection, but reviewing those coverages, <clears throat> excuse me, reviewing those coverages so that you can actually know what's in those policies would be very important. Wow, okay, cool. Um, oh, I want to mention on annuities and life insurance, yeah, yeah. those have state specific laws that can protect you, but often there's an agent selling life insurance and annuities and there are hidden commissions, so you want to be really careful Ooh. about that. And you want someone who understands those products, who's on your side, who isn't going to get compensated by that sale. So like not a broker? Not a broker, not an insurance agent. An independent. Someone who's not only independent, but isn't going to take a commission on the insurance product. So and you some, can straight up ask that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when we work with entrepreneurs and if they need, let's say, life insurance and we bring in an agent or they bring in an agent, we require them to disclose their commissions. We require them to blend down their commissions. A lot of people don't know, but agents can actually blend down their commissions. So we'll negotiate what's reasonable for our client to pay on the life insurance product. Most people just buy it once they believe in the concept and they buy whatever retail off the shelf product that agent is selling them. Mm -hmm. So just be careful on life insurance and annuities. Uh, I'd say tread with caution in that area. You do another thing where like, um you know, in order to protect wealth, where you set up like six different LLCs, right? And, Definitely. and so to talk to me about that really quick. So that's the use of entities and trusts. So often the structure we'll see is the entrepreneur will set up some sort of holding company and it's usually in a state that's beneficial for asset protection. So it could be Nevada, Delaware, Alaska, South Dakota are some of the popular states for good asset protection. And then below that holding company, you're going to drop down LLCs that are going to own different parts of the business. So you might have one LLC that owns your building, another that owns your operations, another that owns your intellectual property. Why is that important? Well, let's say you get sued for copyright infringement with your intellectual property. Well, if you, don't, if you have it all in one big company, they're going to sue you for everything in the company. They're, if you have it in a separate LLC, they can't sue you for the building, they can't sue you for the operations. So they're just isolated in that intellectual property. It also allows you, when you sell your business, just to sell a piece. So you could sell your intellectual property to a company with an agreement so that you have a lease back agreement so you can actually sell a piece of your company and make money without selling the whole thing. Because sometimes someone might pay for your whole company just because they want the one piece. You can keep the rest of your company and make money off selling that one piece. But yeah, I mean, that's all the kind of stuff that we do is we make sure that you've got the right asset protection attorney or the right accountant or the right estate attorney because all this blends together. The asset protection and the tax planning mm -hmm. go together. The estate planning goes together. All of that is the insurance planning. It all pieces together like a puzzle. And to have it strong, it's just like you talk about fitness. If you're going to exercise, you can't just do strength training anymore. Right, right. You can't just do cardio. You got to do cardio, flexibility, hit training, all this stuff together if you want to be a complete person with your physical health. The same thing with all these pieces. You want to be complete with all these pieces and they need to be working together. Guys, everyone watching right now, I want you to use the comment box and I want you to tell me what's the biggest takeaway you got from today? Because there was a lot of good takeaways. And I know you guys, I had you guys engaging throughout the, the whole show today, but um, there's some, a, a lot of really good takeaways when it came to 401ks, when it came to uh, knowing your neighbors and how to, how to defer payments so you don't have to buy their business all up front, lines of credit, there's a ton of stuff, all this stuff, what's one or two really big takeaways? I'd love to hear your thoughts. And um, Jim, you've been great, man. This is really, really good. I, I learned so much from you outside of this podcast episode and then being able to come here and ask more questions is just even better. Um, guys, for anybody here that you, you said you were gonna do something cool, this is a great book, guys, and he's gonna be giving away 40 of these. So uh, you guys want a book? Use a comment box. Okay, great. Now that you use the comment box, I'm going to tell you what you have to do. You have to actually go to gsdwithjim.com. That's gsdwithjim.com. The first 40 people that request the book are going to go ahead and get a copy of the book, and you're going to give away a Make Rich Real scorecard. It's like nine questions, right? Right. And and everyone after 40, so the 41st person, unfortunately, you won't get a book because you didn't act quick enough. GSD is representative of taking action, so it's your fault. Uh, but for the 41st person on, you will still get that Make Rich Real scorecard so you can see where you're at, answer the nine questions, and go from there. Is that, is that right? Right. It's nine questions to help you evaluate where you are in your wealth planning as a business owner, and it will give you just a good snapshot of that. 
Love it. I had a, a great time today, man. For anybody that still has questions, wants to know more, you can call 480-750-9774. Remember to like, remember to share, remember to subscribe. Do all the things that you know help this show keep going if you like the show. If you don't like the show, don't do anything. But if you like the show, do as much as you possibly can to help it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Jim, thanks so much for being on the show. You're welcome, Mike. Yep. Great and we will you. see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, or YouTube. And to watch more episodes and get exclusive links from each episode, go to gsdshow.com. Again, that's gsdshow.com.